Well, thank you all for coming today to discuss this important amicus brief that I filed along with 44 other members of Congress and all 25 members of the Republican Texas delegation. And uh, we did so in support of our governor and our state elected leaders, as well as our fellow Texans back home. Not only is this president and secretary failing to provide for a common defense and willfully disregarding the laws of the land, they are obstructing our state's effort to protect our citizens and defend our border. Our state leaders have taken a number of measures to defend our border and our citizens over the years uh, since this administration's open border policies and lawlessness and chaos have ensued at our southern border. Operation Lone Star, marshalling our, our law enforcement from across the state and our National Guard, the deployment of razor wire fencing and buoy barriers, the construction of a state border wall, and now uh, the, the, the issue, uh, central legal issue, is that uh, which is involved in Senate Bill 4, which makes it illegal to cross into Texas makes it a state crime to do so, and uh, people who, who do perpetrate that crime are subject to apprehension, detention, and or uh, deportation. Now, the Department of Justice is suing the state of Texas on the legal basis that immigration is a sole responsibility of the federal government. However, Texas is making a very different argument on the constitutional basis that A, the federal government has failed to protect, as it says in the Constitution, each and every state from an invasion. That's Article 4, Section 4. And B, that this actual invasion uh, is happening in Texas and is causing imminent danger and putting our citizens at risk. The Constitution is clear and unequivocal. If a state has actually been invaded, or there is imminent danger such that will not permit delay, to use the words of the Constitution, every state has the inherent and sovereign right of self-defense. Two things that are important for people here in Washington, Washington to understand about Texans, and I think my fellow Texans will back me up on this, two very important things. One, Texans will not play passive victim to a failed federal government. And secondly, Texans will not ask permission from a derelict commander-in-chief or a secretary of Homeland Security who refuses to enforce the law in order for us to defend our border and protect our people. Yesterday, the House impeached Alejandro Mayorkas for his dereliction of duty, for his breach of public trust, and the systemic and serious harm it has caused our society. Regardless of what happens in the Senate, I believe that a conviction is coming in November, and not only for Secretary Mayorkas, but for our Commander-in-Chief and his entire chain of command. And with that, I would yield to our Border Caucus Chair uh, and my dear friend from uh, the southeastern region of Texas, Texas 36, Brian Bannon. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Jody. I'm uh, proud to be up here and uh, your initiative is <clears throat> so so very badly needed uh, for our country to rally around uh, our great state, the Lone Star State. Uh, so we're here to, to support Texas's Senate Bill 4, a common sense piece of legislation that rightfully criminalizes illegal entry and reentry and sends those who come here unlawfully right back across the border. As we heard my friend Jody Arrington say, we have a derelict administration. Texas has to protect ourselves and our citizens. Let's be clear. When states like Texas joined the union, they did not cede out, give away their right to self-defense. The federal government merely took on that responsibility until this administration uh, took the reins. Thankfully, however, our founders had enough foresight to ensure that the Constitution explicitly guarantees states the right to defend themselves from an invasion. 
an especially critical guarantee in the wake of a federal government refusing to fulfill its obligation to do so. Since creating the border crisis by purposefully dismantling Donald Trump's policies that were working to keep our borders uh, secure and our nation safe, Joe Biden has utterly abandoned our states to their own devices. We're being invaded without question. And this negligent administration left a massive void. Fortunately, Texas has stepped in to fill that gap. Clearly, our elderly president with a poor memory, his border czar who is MIA, and his newly impeached Homeland Security Secretary do not care if our southern border exists or since they have done absolutely everything in their power to leave it wide open and ensure it's erasure. But Texas, the Lone Star State, I'm proud to be from Texas's 36th district, it cares about the preservation of our, of our nation, and it will not stand idly by and watch while America simply vanishes. The actions that the Lone Star State has taken to secure the southern border are absolutely just and vital to protect Texans, Americans, and American sovereignty. I support this amicus brief without any hesitation whatsoever, just as I will continue to support the great state of Texas. Thank you very much. We'll now turn the podium over to our uh, friend, former Navy SEAL, chairman of the Drug Cartel Task Force, uh, representing Texas, too, Dan Crenshaw. Thank you, Jody. Th thank you, Jody, for putting this together. And uh, thank you to our governor for, for taking action. This is something we've been talking about for a long time. Our governor is a careful man. He is uh, he's a lawyer. And he put a lot of thought into this. And this isn't an issue of politics. This is an issue of sovereignty. This is an issue of what's fair to legal migrants who do it the right way. Uh, this is an issue of safety with respect to the drug cartels that, that control the entirety of the southern border. If anybody's to say that they have operational control of the border, they'd be lying, unless they're the drug cartels. They do have operational control, and they make tens of billions a year from charging people across that border and bringing people to that border. That's what this is about. This isn't about politics. This is about Texas having to do the job of the federal government and I think having the legal right to do so. You know, Texans are being taxed twice. Uh, they're taxed twice because we have to pay for all of our operations on the border and we also pay federal taxes. I've introduced legislation to pay Texas back for that it's called the, the Border State uh, Reimbursement Act. But it's also worth noting that People come up to podiums up in this office, and they say all the time that every state's a border state. Every state is not a border state. Texas is a border state. And we're the state that actually puts the most resources toward trying to solve the problem. And that's what this is about. This is about solving the problem. So instead of suing the state of Texas, the federal government should be paying back and thanking the state of Texas. So I'm glad to be here with my colleagues, to be up here and support our governor in those actions. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Next, the uh, first female mayor from Irving, Texas, and my fellow uh, colleague on Ways and Means, Beth Van Dyne, representing Texas 24. Thank you very much. From day one, through purposeful and persistent actions, the Biden administration has shredded meaningful and effective Trump-era border policies that were actually working. And rather than having nominal control and far less illegal immigration, they've created a national security and humanitarian nightmare. By turning over control of our southern border to the Mexican cartels, Biden has ushered in a new era of mass illegal immigration that is overwhelming states, cities, and services for the American people. Biden's reckless and destructive administration has simply not just simply abdicated their federal responsibility to protect our border and the people of Texas, but they have deliberately caused what the American people justifiably see as an invasion which has delivered deadly consequences. More than 1,100 North Texans have died from fentanyl poisoning since Biden took office. Fentanyl-related deaths have increased by 33 percent since 2019 and now account for almost half of all drug-related deaths, killing an average of five Texans per day. In Tarrant County, the sheriff's office saw a 1,000 percent increase in the amount of drugs seized in a short two-year span. In 2020, they seized $3 million worth of drugs. 
In 2022, it was $35 million. I'm proud of the state of Texas and Governor Abbott for taking the mantle of leadership to fight this, the Biden border invasion with every resource and constitutional authority they have. As we rightfully noted in this amicus brief, Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution ensures states have the ability to defend themselves in the absence of the federal government and when a real and imminent threat is presented. Sadly, we aren't seeing an absence of the federal government, but with Biden and Mayorkas, the federal government is actively working to support, fund, and facilitate not just this invasion, but the operations of Mexican cartels who are wholesale killing and enslaving people all across our country. By the actions Texas is taking to construct barriers, deter illegal crossings along our border, and making it more difficult for the Mexican cartel's human trafficking programs, illegal immigrant encounters have dropped significantly in many sections of the Texas border, but nearly 76 percent from December to January. Texas has once again shown the federal government is lying to the American people when Biden claims that there's nothing that can be done under existing authority to stop his engineered invasion. The American people stand with Texas in our fight to protect our state and the union. We clearly stand with Texas in this ongoing and existential fight, and we urge the Supreme Court to recognize Texas is acting lawfully and responsibly to do the job that this administration refuses to do. Thank you for being here today and for covering this national security. Thank you, Beth. Now, federalism the sovereignty of states and every state's inherent right of self-defense is not just a Texas issue. It's an issue for every state in the union, including South Carolina. So to prove this isn't just the Kool-Aid we drink at our Texas lunches, we've had, uh, we've asked our honorary Texan, David Rouser from South Carolina, to say a few North words. Carolina. Now, <laughs> the Carolinas. Whatever, Texas the Carolinas. Is both. <laughs> it, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> And Jody and I, and I have known each other a long time, and I can understand how you might get confused Many with South Carolina numbers. and North Carolina. But uh, I was thinking uh, while, I, while my uh, colleagues uh, were speaking, I said some of my constituents in North Carolina are going to be a little worried I might have moved to Texas. Of course, then I thought, well, there's, <laughs> then I thought, well, there's some folks in my district that would be glad if I moved to Texas, probably. So, But uh, it's a, uh, a, a real honor to stand with these uh, fine colleagues uh, from Texas, uh, they are a border state. Uh, it is really uh, astonishing that this administration has totally, completely abdicated its responsibility mm -hmm. in protecting our border, not just Texas, but Arizona and everywhere else. Now, now, it's technically true North Carolina is not a border state, but I can tell you this, we have the drugs pouring in and pouring in in a big way, much more so uh, than during the previous administration. And we all know what took place uh, with the Biden administration. They repealed every single policy that this that uh, President Trump had in place to secure the border. There's really no need to, uh, uh, you know, pass new law in terms of border uh, enforcement. This president has every uh, authority under current law to enforce the border. And that point needs to be made repeatedly, I think. Uh, this is a national crisis. Texas is uh, at the forefront. They're, they're the tip of the spear. And so I'm proud to support uh, my friends uh, from Texas in their, in their effort uh, by signing on to this amicus brief and uh, really truly hope that the Supreme Court will give ample consideration uh, to the uh, necessity of uh, of this uh, of this suit, uh, it's critically important, I think, moving forward uh, for the country, and not just for Texas, but for the entire country in terms of our national security. With that, I'll yield back. I think the gentleman from North Carolina. It could have been worse. I could have said he hailed from California or Massachusetts. Uh, with that, uh, if there are any questions, we're happy to entertain them. Yes, sir. Actually, I have two questions. Uh -huh. um, the first one is, I assume you've talked with your Texas Democratic colleagues about this brief, but I don't see any of them up here for you. Um, I think our, tech, our, our Democrat colleagues from Texas are well aware of the efforts that our leaders in Texas have deployed to fill the gap, to hold the line, and to do the job the federal government under this 
administration has failed to do. Um, they're also aware that this administration has resorted to uh, these far afield arguments like the 1800s Harbor and Rivers Act and directing the Department of Interior to claim the Mexican mussel as critical habitat. I mean, it's, uh, it's obvious the extent and the extremes that this administration will go, not only to not do their job, but to prevent Texas from, uh, uh, from, from doing the job for them in protecting their citizens. So I can't explain uh, or I won't give the excuse why Democrats are up here. I'll let you ask them. Uh, but uh, but this is this isn't a partisan issue. It's an issue again, as Dan said. It's not political. It's about our sovereignty, and it's about the inherent right of all states to defend themselves, as our forefathers wrote into that Constitution. When uh, the danger is so imminent and threatening to the citizenry that it shall not permit delay, then it would be irresponsible for our state leaders not to do what they're doing. The problem is they're being harassed and obstructed in, on, at every turn. And uh, we, we hope this central question, though, of state sovereign right of self-defense, uh, we, we believe it will be meted out and probably ultimately at the Supreme Court, and that's why this amicus brief is so important. I'm going to go to her and then come back to you. Yes, ma'am. Well, he has broad authority in an emergency or crisis to turn any and every person in this country who crosses the border illegally, uh, turn them back to their country of origin for any reason. That is the broadest authority that the president has. But really, all you have to do is look at the previous administration and you will see the stark contrast. The same laws and policies that are on the books today were on the books then, except you had a president in Donald Trump who was willing to use the tools and authority to stop the flow and secure the border. And that's why we saw a significant drop. I think it was over 70 percent in the terms of the flow of illegal immigrants. And he and the Trump administration effectively secured the border. And, and obviously, you're familiar with remain in Mexico. Uh, the law says shall detain when someone has crossed illegally. They get a court date. They get uh, due process to see if they have credible asylum claims. But the law says shall detain. And uh, even with criminal aliens, the Secretary of Homeland Security, Mayorkas, had blanket broad direction under the guise of prosecutorial discretion to say that we will not detain even criminal aliens. So uh, they're, they're, they, sure, there are ways to improve the legal process. Certainly, there are loopholes that need to be closed and magnets that need to be turned off that, that uh, incentivize the flow of illegal immigration. But the authorities are there, and it is nothing but political cover and an excuse to suggest otherwise. And by the way, this president and Secretary Mayorkas has said for the last three years that the border is under our control and that the border is secure and that it's not a crisis until it was politically convenient when you had a Senate uh, bill that was portraying itself as a border security bill. And then he changed his tone. It's a great question. And I, I'm asking you that because I have a source in Texas who has stated that uh, Governor Abbott is um, getting support from the National Guard from other states. Um, can you clarify if that is what's happening? And then also to the question of how far reaching any governor's power should be if we could elaborate on that. Well, I, uh, unlike just legal precedent, this is the plain language of the Constitution, and I'm not a lawyer, but it is clear and unequivocal 
that when there is an actual invasion or, and these, these are the words of the Constitution in Article 1, Section 10, an actual invasion or imminent danger such that will not permit delay, the states have that right of self-defense. Now, I'm sure uh, there are uh, various contours to that discussion that the courts will take up, but this isn't something that is being you know, uh, divined by state leaders in Texas. This is the plain language of the Constitution. The arguments in the past, for example, U.S. v. Arizona, uh, the last time a, an immigration case went to the Supreme Court, a seminal question was asked, can a state enforce federal laws if the federal government is not? Now, mo the, the conservative jurist said that they could. But it was a more liberal court, and they struck down Arizona's claim that they could do that. They said that the federal government has sole jurisdiction over enforcing immigration laws. That's not what Governor Abbott and the leaders of Texas are arguing. They're arguing that Article 4, Section 4, the Guarantee Clause, guaranteeing protection against invasion, the feds have failed in that. And then Article 110 that there is an actual invasion and there's imminent threat. So the state of Texas has the broadest latitude to do what it needs to do with the tools and authorities and resources they have. By the way, they've been doing this to the tune of billions of dollars for the last three years. As I mentioned, Operation Lone Star, the razor wire, the, 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 the border wall, um, the buoy barriers. But this question will be uh, central to state sovereignty, federalism, not just in Texas, but across across the land. Yes, sir. Do you have a reaction to the White House refusing to meet with Speaker Johnson? And should they meet, Speaker Johnson try to continue meeting with the White House? And if so, is this something that could be negotiated if, in fact, Johnson could come to a border agreement with the White House? I think it's worrisome that the President of the United States is not sitting down with the leader of the House to discuss funding the government and the policies and direction of our country, especially as it relates to the most imminent threat to our security and to the safety of our citizens, which is the border crisis that his administration and he have created. Um, I suspect, and there's been a lot of discussion about uh, his cognitive challenges and his mental health state, uh, that they may be protecting him uh, from engaging and uh, further disclosing those challenges. But that's just what I surmise because of what I read. But, uh, it's, a, it, but it's a problem when the issues of, of this significance arise, funding the government, making sure we make good on our commitment in the Fiscal Responsibility Act to rein in spending, and then to secure the border and work out those uh, policy issues, I think it should be concerning to all Americans. Where is uh, our commander in chief? Where is our chief executive in these conversations? Except we know where his DOJ is. It's suing, it's harassing, and it's obstructing the state of Texas, picking up the slack uh, for a federal government that has abandoned them in their time of need. Well, thank you all for coming. Yes, sir, I told you I'd get back to you. I apologize. What if, I know you don't like hypotheticals, what if the Supreme Court rejects the Texas Constitution? Then what happens? What's going to happen to Texas? I'd say what's going to happen to the United States, what's going to happen to the central principle of federalism? I think it's important, and I often remind the students at the local high schools and junior highs throughout my district, that the sovereign states created the federal government, not the other way around. This was the social compact, the United States Constitution. And this social compact um, made provision for such a circumstance that we find ourselves. And we talk about the brilliance of our founding fathers and the divine guidance to, to form the more perfect union. Well, this was something that was well anticipated. Maybe it was because they were skeptical and wary of a central government that might fail for reasons other than logistics to, to come to the aid of a state. But this was a way that states could remind the feds 
that the states came first and that the, that the priority of the citizens of every state um, will be preeminent in a, in, the, in, in a circumstance where there is an imminent danger and an invasion. So um, I, I can't imagine what happens to the country if we lose any more of the um, – the sovereign state rights that uh, the forefathers, our founding fathers, uh, enshrined in the Constitution, especially over one so important. This isn't a debate about the uh, Commerce Clause. This is, a, this is an issue of the safety and security of the citizens of, of Texas and every state uh, when, we, when we have, as uh, Mr. Rouser says, a federal government that's abdicated its first and most important responsibility. Yeah. Thank you, guys. You know why I screwed that up? <laughs> because I had you and Jeff Duncan oh, you did. on the, on the, and, and uh, they put him at the same